Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to get through us is to come through the website. They won't get lost in the mix that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, for today's topic, we're answering the question, what's the problem? As we sit down and discuss potentially problematic content in tabletop games. So I decided this was going to be a good topic to talk about on our show while working on my review for Tante Cora. Uh, this is a pretty heavy topic and not one I've heard talked about often, especially when looking at tabletop games as a whole and not role-playing games. I have seen multiple role-playing uh, shows talk about problematic content and safety at the table, but it's not something that comes up as often when talking about board games as well. And I thought it was a conversation worth having. And I do want this to be a conversation. That's why I haven't written up an article, right? Normally we come in here and I've already published an Ask the Bellhop article. I've already even gotten some feedback on it by the time we talk about it in the show. And I'll admit it, most of our Ask the Bellhop segments are pretty scripted. This one is not. Um, past this point, <laughs> we've got a bunch of bullet points on things I think we want to talk about. But I don't have any final opinions noted down here. Uh, to be honest, I have, think I have a pretty good idea where Sean feels on these things, but I don't know for sure. Um, I know where I sit, but I am also willing to have my opinion changed. And for those of you in the chat room, please feel free to jump in at any time if you have any comments or anything you'd like to add or question for us. All right. So I think uh, based on that review, we're going to start off with adult themes. Yeah. So as we already mentioned, Tonto Corey isn't meant to be an adult game, for one thing. But you cannot deny that with North American sensibilities, that there's something there, right? Uh, the first thing Mike said when he said, what is this, some type of hentai game? And I'm like, actually, no, it's not. It's, to be honest, I don't even know the different terms for the different types of high school anime and everything, but it's like a sojin or whatever. It's The, the closest you are going to get is suggestion. There is nothing actual adult in it. But there are games that take this further. Uh, for example, there are two games that are very similar. Actually, Ferroticon being the one that is most similar to this, is a game where you are playing furries. You control a harem. You are trying to use your harem to make the opponent's furry climax. That is not implied. That is explicit. Well, and that's, I mean, th now that is an adult game. Period. Yes. No question. Very true. Now, the problem with Tonto Quarry is actually a little on the different side. It's North Americans see it as a sexualization uh, and, and, and see the problem in the sexual aspects and the, you know, bringing chambermaids to your private quarters with love. Mm -hmm. That's where we... Now, the, the, now, I still see actually see the game. Now that I've, I've looked into it more and I've read up a little bit more, both on the maid culture and on some of the translation issues in the game... What I'm actually seeing is that it's a very different problem. Uh, there's actually a problem of lack of respect of women, not in a sexualization way, but in an almost subservient, uh, subservient and objectified mm -hmm. way. So the maid situation in Japan seems to be more of uh, a man will come home from, you know, finish up a, a long business day and need affection not in a sexual or physical manner, but needs someone who just is there to take care of them and, and love them in a, you know, sort of giving all to you manner. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the maid culture seems to be about from my reading. Uh, it, it's not a physical attention. It's not a physical release. It is an emotional release. And yet right. it's still no better that women are being used in that way. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, though, is there's also a very solid side of girl power to it with girls walking down the street Tokyo in the maid outfit. So there's there's the kawaii cult, cute culture aspect of it as well, where the women have kind of taken it over and do the ears. And there there is. But at the same point, I think a lot of it is an attention grabbing thing. It's one of those things where are they dressing sexual uh, sexually as a self empowerment? Or are they dressing sexually because they can get something by, yeah, you know, doing that because men want it. 
So that's that's basically no different than some women dressing sexually here in North America. Exactly. Um, it's, so, yeah. Deanna points out, and one of the things she pointed this out at the time, I was going to get to this, is it wasn't the her problem with it, it wasn't the fact that the, the maids were being sexy or that you were using glove or putting them in your private chambers. It was the fact that a bunch of them look like they're seven years old. And it's true. There are uh, a couple of the characters I purposely didn't put one in my review because she looked ridiculously young, like literally seven years old. Now she also had a big ass gun. So very anime thing. And then that gets into a whole other thing that I haven't looked into is Japan. Japan is also really big on a Lolita culture. And the whole Lolita aspect gets combined with the maid aspect, and you get some of the artwork in Tante Koro. Absolutely. And again, here we're getting back into the whole Japanese concepts of things where the women are supposed to be, you know, small, submissive, submissive mm -hmm. respectful, and yes. small and, and, and when you when you when you take what uh what at least we think of as sort of the typical Japanese body type, the small petite woman it's really easy to age them down, right? It, it's, yes. They look young really mm -hmm. easily. And so a lot of that is what it comes to. So it's, it's the Lolita thing sort of falls naturally into their ideal body types as well. So even if they are sure. necessarily thinking about young girls, the, the concept comes out that way to us who mm -hmm. are expecting a, a grown adult woman to look a certain way, right or wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when we see that, their vision, it comes off immediately to our sensibilities as underage. Um, and so is it a problem that's in this game? Or is this game just representing a culture that's not our own, so we're kind of shocked by it? Well, it's this is a different one. Like, there's, there's other topics here that I'm a little, I'm a little more hard, uh, you know, yeah. I, I take a stand on. It's, it's hard to say that something that is currently occurring right now is you know, right or wrong. Um, you know, this is something, you know, the maid culture in Japan is something that people mm -hmm. have an absolute choice to do. Um, yep. but at the same time, some of those choices are encouraged by cultural norms and long-term yeah. bigotry. Is that the right term? Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's one of those things where if, you know, it's, they're doing it by choice. Uh, you look at something like strippers, um, you know, Yes, it's their choice to work in a club to dance for men, but they're doing that because they have been, you know, men are enabling this mm -hmm. derogatory. You well, know, plus, plus there's the whole at, um, uh, human trafficking aspect. Yes, that's a huge part there of is, there is. the North American, which, which I don't porn I, and stripper scene, which I don't believe which is I happening in the maid cafes. But again, I, I don't I have any. I actually, I, as far as I could tell, based on the bit of research I did, um, that didn't seem to be an aspect of it that I saw. But maybe that's something that's not talked about. I don't know. And and for, so, for all we know, there there could be a an adult made culture, cafe, an adult made cafe culture that I'm not aware of. Uh, so when I'm speaking, I'm speaking of the the popular, you know, the yes. made cafes that are out there where mm -hmm. they are dressing skimpy, but it is not about anything sexual. You know, it is about this this sort of this caring and and giving of one's attention to. The client not physically but emotionally so uh, that's going to lead me to probably it's going to be my point that i'm going to repeat a hundred times here tonight on every topic what i think is important here when it comes to this game or any other game like this is to be aware of this be aware of where this is coming from be aware of that it, that it is a cultural thing and that our culture is not the same uh, be aware that it isn't meant to be explicitly sexual, but some people probably, and like it, it's a given, some people do think it's that way. Uh, people marry their pillows in Japan, um, which is a big part of anime culture over there. I bet you there's someone out there who has married one of the maids from Tante Koro in Japan. Uh, but I think the important thing is to be aware of that and then put that into your decision whether you want to play the game or not. I don't think people playing this game is harming anything. Um, it's, it's interesting. And, and Angie Gaines brings up a really good point in the chat room. So she says, uh, this is a case of something getting shifted in translation and I can flow with that, but I feel like the publisher bringing it over to North America is well aware of the sexy risqueness here and is cashing in on that. And that's hard to deny. I mean, they are definitely saying North America gets off on hat scantily clad 
anime women and we'll make money off that even though in Japan it's not about that and that becomes a little more problematic um do you support them because they are cashing in on the sexual mores of North Americans uh you know we could I mean, we could go for hours probably on the puritan origins of the yeah. North American uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in this case, I find it really hard to compare that any different from a suggestive Marvel comic covers or any other form of art medium that uses scantily clad women. Yeah, no, they're, I, they're I, both cashing in. Absolutely. Right? Like, I, I don't see this as any different, and I this is why it's a hard topic. Well, I think the, diff the difference would be they are taking something that is, and I hesitate I don't to think say it's all same. that innocent in Japan either, to okay. be honest. Like, I, I really don't. Like, like yeah, she can have the maid culture, but she doesn't have to be bent over humping a pillow. <laughs> right? Like, like that's Fair taking enough. it that next step. And the love cards, by the time you get to the third love, the position of that third pillow is, is definitely suggested. Fair enough. I don't know. I, like, it, part of it, it's difficult. Like, it's, uh, it's not... Again, I'm gonna play, once we get to the other topic, I'm gonna say the same thing. This is this is one of the ways I, I think I can explain this is I am not a fan of the comics code. The comics code is something that happened, I couldn't tell you, the fifties, whatever. I don't remember when it happened, whatever it happened, and a whole bunch of people decided the comics were bad and you weren't allowed to show violence, you weren't allowed to show nudity and all this stuff, and they put out all these rules. And Marvel themselves broke away from this, and a bunch of really well known comic cards broke away from it because freedom of expression is important. And there are people out there who are going to enjoy questionable content. And I think that's okay because you're consuming it as entertainment. Maybe that's cathartic. I don't know. I am no psychologist. We need a Brian Kurtz in here to explain why people like playing violent video games and shooting each other and how that doesn't correlate to actually shooting each other and that it can be cathartic. It's the same kind of thing, right? And I very firmly believe in the freedom to create games like this for these games to be on the market and for people to purchase them if they wish. The step to me that I think is more necessary nowadays than I'd considered in the past because I hadn't even thought of it is now I think you have to take that step first to consider it, to look at it, to look at why it's problematic, realize that some people are going to find it problematic, realize why maybe you should find it problematic and then make a decision to go forward or not. I will fully admit it. I like titillation. I like sword and sandal. I like red Sonia. I, I like my boob plate in fantasy games. And I don't think that's horrible. I also think it should be equally represented and Conan should be showing off his muscles as much, right? Like I, I like the old Dieter Lisey art, right? I like the Braum backs. I used to collect heavy metal magazine and I still d dig that aesthetic. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I realize nowadays that there's, problems there right especially like sean talked about the objectification right the in class systems and implied class systems and implied powerlessness of women i see that and i get it more now than i ever did before but doesn't mean i necessarily think that all of that stuff's bad yeah again everything comes from a, a starting point and and understanding where that uh where that starting point is is important to understand. So you have to understand when you're looking at Red Sonia, when that character was created and when that art was drawn and where the artist was and you know in a world view and even at that point. And the same with Tanto Kore. Um, you know, it, it comes from a time and it comes from a certain period and a certain space in the world where certain things mean certain things, uh, whatever that may be. Um, and, and knowing and understanding that framework for where the game came from is important. So another thing, too, is I find it really weird that people, especially North Americans, especially people south of the border, I'm generalizing here, obviously, get so damn upset about sexually suggestive material, but have no problem with sawing an orc in half with a chainsaw or a chain sword and that that's perfectly fine with blood spraying everywhere but oh my god this maid is next to a heart-shaped pillow possibly rubbing it and that is something i think it's a canadian thing because it, it, in it canada is. 
we we grew up much more uh, sexually liberated is not the right term, but like there was nudity on TV and it was no big deal. Women can walk around topless downtown Windsor and it's it's fine because we're both men and women. So what we have different bits, it's hot out. Take your shirt off. Um, it, there's definitely a different attitude there. And I find it really weird that people have a problem with Tante Coro, but don't have a problem with a million other gaming topics that, yeah. with the violence and the the killing monsters and which we're going to get to some of that in a bit but I, I like like this seems so innocent and harmless in comparison no absolutely. um plus uh, fetishes are okay again if it's consensual and in this case you're not hiring actual maids or lolita girls you're playing a card game about them if that titillates you cool uh just you don't take it that step further, right? Like, no, absolutely. Uh, and it's it's really interesting. Uh, one of the biggest divides, and that sort of drove things home for me in the the American Canadian difference, uh, was way back in the day when the Ozzy Osbourne, the Osbournes, was on TV. Mm -hmm. Um, now I I wasn't a fan of the show, but I'd seen a couple of episodes, and it was hilarious. And then I was on tour at one point and I was sitting in a hotel room and I turned it on and the show was unwatchable because it was essentially Morse code because they were actually bleeping out the profanity God, the in the show, yeah. except the show was half profanity. So well, you yes. were literally watching a show with Morse code played over top. <laughs> um, it was it was horrible. I, I I don't understand how it became a successful show in America because you couldn't hear anything. Um, at least you know if you were able to understand it. You know, again, it wasn't for me, but I could have mm -hmm. I could understand why some people would watch it in Canada. But then to find out that America, where the show was designed for, wasn't even hearing it. Um, now I don't know if that was if maybe MTV wasn't doing that, and I was watching it on a network yeah, rerun, knows. maybe. But uh, you know, just something as simple as that. Um, you yeah. know, where you can't drop, you know, you can't say, you can't say sex, but you can cut someone in half with a chainsaw. Yeah. Uh, the, like I said, the violence versus sexuality thing is something yeah. I find disturbing, to be honest. Like it's, it's, it's odd. It is. It is. And, and that's, and that's very much, again, this good, this goes right back to what I was saying earlier with the puritanical origins of America, the, the country as a whole um, and, and again, this isn't an individual thing. It's very much a, a countrywide concept that has moved in this very anti-sexual manner mm -hmm. from its very origins, like from the, the Puritans who came over and settled the new world. Uh, mm -hmm. and they've stayed in that sort of strange mindset, um, historically. And it's, it's just, you know, they've, they've been trapped that way. Whereas, you know, you go to Europe and a nude beach is a nude beach. It's just a beach. Yes. You know, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't think about that sort of thing. Whereas that's still shocking in America. Yeah. Japan has a very similar puritanical thing, which is why they're, they're yes, it's a very different it, it, puritanical. It's thing, a very though. different puritanical thing. And there's certain things that are still illegal there. That's surprising. And how they get around those, like there's a reason tentacle hentai exists because they're not allowed to show the other, uh, but that's another topic. Yeah. No. So one thing that it's, we're t t talking about sexuality in North America, uh, just to bring up another game here is one that is very much sex positive. Now this is an adult game. Uh, it was made in North America, I think in America specifically, and it is about the romance, the sexual encounter between a human and an alien. And you are playing that out, and the game is called Consentical. So here is a game that is subverting the ideas of making overly sexualized games by making an overly sexualized game, but it's all about consent and a loving relationship, which I got to say I find fascinating. Now, I'm sure there's people out there that are going to be very upset that Consentical exists, as much so as Tante Coro. Uh, that is a an actual game. I was in Deanna and I were talking about it the other night. I showed her pictures from it. I got to admit, I like the Kickstarter art better than the final art. No, I've never played the game. Uh, I'm somewhat curious. It's not really, I don't know, the, the, the alien human thing's a little unique to me. But there's a game, though, that takes this on its edge and basically says very clearly, this is okay that we can have games about this and we can enjoy this and we can talk about this, which I think is a great other side to this. And most instead of it feeling subversive. And most importantly, teaching consent. 
which yes. is just something that hasn't been taught. They are just finally getting around to teaching it in Canadian schools. I have no mm -hmm. idea what's happening in America, but I know in Canada, in the public schools, they are finally teaching it. Uh, unfortunately, in the Catholic and private schools, there are still all sorts of problems with the, the sexual education that's mm -hmm. happening. But they finally updated the curriculum for the public schools mm -hmm. to teach people about gender and sexuality and consent. And that's something that we should have been teaching kids decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if it takes an alien and a uh, human, yep. all the better. Uh, I am and, all for and that's this. The core, that's the core to me, the core, the core, the root of where I expected to end up with this conversation is this is all about consent. Uh, you are, we talked about cats. We talked about session zero. That's role playing terms, but that's what you need to do is if everyone at your table is perfectly cool playing a game about hiring maids and maybe making some off color jokes, that's great. So like when we started playing the other day, I could tell that one of the players wasn't sure. Because they had played before, and the entire thing was people making sexually inappropriate jokes, and it made that player play uncomfortable. When we played Monday, it didn't go there. And there was one point where it almost went there, which goes to an after-show topic, which those of you who listen to the podcast missed, unless you back our Patreon, where I was talking about having safety tools in board games and how there are certain games out there that could use an X card. Now, admit, both Sean and I were both, man, which games? And we were having a hard time. Well, Tante Coral was one. Because we were playing Monday night and we got to a point where some, basically someone X carded it because someone said, I finger the girl. And we're like, no, stop. No, back that up. It is you are using a service. And yes, the symbol for a service is someone pointing, but you're using a service to get the girl to do an action. You're not fingering the girl. That's taking it a step too far. We're here to play a game. It's not actually about that. And we backed it up and we kept playing the game and we didn't make that joke anymore. Yeah. And, it, and to be fair, I mean, this is a really easy joke to make in this game. Uh, yes. because again, and we didn't talk about this during this during the review, but the action of, of, of having someone do an action is you point so at the maid to do, to, to have them do something. Uh, and so I was told it was actually someone snapping their fingers. Oh, interesting. Is what that symbol is supposed to be is interesting. Okay. You're snapping your fingers to get the maid over to service you. That's which, actually again, the term service way you. worse than pointing to have them yes. do an action. Um, <laughs> but, but the actual term is a service. You get yeah. one service a turn and you choose yes. a mer maid to service you. That is yeah. rules from the game. Again, I'm not commenting on if it's appropriate or it's meant to be sexual or not. That is the terminology is service. But I was told that it was it was a snap the fingers, not a you go. Yeah, interesting. Which. Yeah, again, yeah. it is what it is. It is. It is. Uh, yeah. Again, I was watching uh, the Geek and Sundry uh, play of it from way back ago, going back. Yeah, it's an, old. An, an old well, it was back when Will and Felicia were the, yeah. the people behind it. Uh, and it was, I mean, they were having a hard time. Uh, Felicia loved the game, but, it, you know, it was really hard not to make jokes during that play. Mm -hmm. um, and again, now, they're also comedians, and, and that's, well, that's yeah. part of it. Hard, hard for I'll admit, we made jokes. Yeah, yeah. Some were off-colored. Yep. Some weren't. Some were just funny. But you have to know um, where to stop it with your, yeah. with your audience. Um, and again, there's a difference again, because we're, you know, there's at some point you need to sort of say, I, I or I feel like there, there needs to be a say where a, a point where you say, okay, this game isn't okay anymore. Uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, if someone were What's to it? create a game about, uh, child trafficking, so you are playing child traffickers and the cards mm -hmm. you've got are teenagers that you're kidnapping. I don't know if I would be okay with that game being there, even if it was a game that people were allowed to have, you know, you know, everyone, everyone knows this is a bad game. I, I, that I'm not sure, you know, there, there are lines that I'm not clear should be crossed at, 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 for publication. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe that, maybe there is a place for that game to open up the discussion. Uh, I know the Wayne Foundation has, you know, mm -hmm. you know, is I, I fully support their actions in stopping uh, child trafficking and sexual trafficking. Yes. Um, go, go support, go, please give money to Wayne foundation. I support them whole. So, but so there is, there is, there is a game about human trafficking and it's a retheme of a game, which I own, which is freedom, the underground railroad. Right. And in this game, you are playing people helping black slaves escape 
Canada or escape the U.S. into Canada right. through the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is a board game you can play. This is a board game some people are going to find problematic. It is a difficult topic, and you're gamifying it. Is it okay to gamify a topic like that? Well, Which kind of leads to our next section is uh, the biggest thing being colonialization. Almost every Euro game ever made is in some way about col colonialization because colonialization logistically is a game, yep. right? Like it's managing your resources. You're trying to expand your territory and you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. You eventually want to build an engine to make that easier to grow your empire quicker. Like that's pretty much the definition of a Euro game. And it's pretty much the definition of what your what, what Great Britain did at one time. And what all the other colonizers in the world did. Uh, so colonization is a fantastic theme for a game because they tie together so well. Absolutely. And some people have a serious problem with the fact that we are turning something that was very horrible to a large number of people into a game. And, you know, there's, there's another way to look at it or another way to take it. You know, you can look at something... Now, Terraforming Mars not, might not be the greatest example, but if you look at sci-fi games colonizing extraterrestrial planets, mm -hmm. there is a reason why we aren't, you know, throwing hunks of ice at Mars and, you know, nuking Mars to try and give it a, uh, um, an atmosphere. Because we don't know what's there, and we don't know what we might be destroying. That's why we're sending completely sterilized robots there to mm -hmm. learn about the planet. Uh, and yet there are all sorts of games out there about going and landing your, mm -hmm. you know, dirty spaceship onto a planet and walking around blowing up samples, uh, you know, yeah. collecting samples and things, which is colonization in the modern and sci-fi realm uh, and can be just as problematic. Uh, we just don't see it that way because we don't see 100 years down the line when we see the effects of colonization. Whereas so that, that you're, you're still you're talking about petri dishes and, and uh, small single celled organisms compared to well, games Mars, like Mombasa, which are about British companies, exploit companies taking over Africa. In, in Mars, you are. But there are other games where there are other, you know, sci fi themes where you're going, you know, One Man's Sky is a perfect example where you are going yeah. to planets of, you know, fully living, you know, not microscopic mm -hmm. being, you know, actual creatures. And, you know, oh, it's all great, except. You know, whereas we know what happened in India, we have we saw mm -hmm. the horrors that were yep. caused by the imperial uh, control over India or the and the, uh, the monarchy in India and and some of the horrors that evolved from that. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, in the sci fi games, because we're in the future, we aren't picturing what's happening 100 yeah. years or a thousand years down the line after we've dropped our dirty spaceship down and potentially wiped out an entire world of living beings. Um, yeah, I get that. You know, we know, we know what happens when we were really nice and gave blankets to the Indians in the new world. Um, Interestingly, there are games that have subverted that idea as well. Right. Um, I don't own it. I wish I did. I'm drawing a complete blank right now. Oh, I'll have to get back to it. There is a game where instead of playing the colonizers, you are playing the indigenous species fighting back. Right. Um, uh, speaking of sci-fi games, Cry, Cry Havoc. When you play three players, you're exploiting a planet. But when you play four players, the fourth player plays the indigenous tribe. Um, oh, the one's a Spirit Island. Spirit Island is the game where you are defending against colonizers. So it does exist. Uh, but there are an awful lot of games about colonization, colonialization. And I, I again, I don't think playing games with those topics is a bad thing. Absolutely. I think they actually make really good engine builders. And again, as long as you're cognizant of what your board game represents and a good board game is going to explain what you're doing in historic terms and how horrible it was, but you're not doing it yourself. It's like watching a sporting event by watching a sporting event. You're not playing that sport. I, because I'm playing Puerto Rico doesn't mean I'm in favor of owning slaves and putting them in my cotton. I, don't quite get that connection. Yes, I do somewhat agree with the 2019 woke mentality idea of maybe we could make making games about other things. And I agree, there are a lot out there and I can't argue with that, but I don't distinctly think that games about games about problematic content, I don't think means they're bad games. 
I just think you have to realize and be cognizant and aware of that history of what's going on. Now, what publishers, I think, should do is be way more damn clear about what their game's about. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't hide it. Say, yes, you are playing a British company. You are raping Africa. Here's what this game represents. And because of this, you may not be interested in playing this game, but we think it's a really interesting competition that you may want to play out with your friends. Yeah. Which, it sounds rather horrible when you put it that way, and it can be. And as Dee said in the chat room, learn history, ignoring it doesn't fix it. And that's one of the big things. If you are going to play a game with a theme, a historical theme, understand that. And, you know, that requires the developer, the publishers, to help you. But, you know, if you're going to play Puerto Rico, understand what that game is about. You know, if you're going to play these games. And if the publisher doesn't want to take the trouble and take the time to make it educational, then take your engine and wipe out the theme. Make it cubes on a board. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to theme it. You know, it doesn't, most of these games will work as an abstract. There doesn't have to be a real world example on there. Um, it, that may have been where their concept came from. They may have, you know, they may have figured out their whole game by reading the history books about what happened in, you know, you pick a country, pick a, pick a, mm -hmm. a, a colonializing, uh, uh, group. It, there's enough of them out there. It's really easy to find that source material, but if you don't want to help educate your pub, your public mm -hmm. and your purchasers about that. Then once you've used that to develop the game, wipe the theme and make it an abstract cubes on a cubes on a board. Now, one of the reasons I do think you should include these themes is wouldn't it be fantastic if someone played this game, a younger kid or even someone our age, and they went, man, I really want to know what happened. I want to research into this. And they actually learn something and actually read some history and spend some time learning from our mistakes instead of repeating them, right? So Deanna made a point about learn history. Ignoring it doesn't fix it, doesn't make it going away. You don't want to be sitting there plugging your ears going, la, 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 la. And if by playing a game about a problematic period in time brings more awareness of that period, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think... A lot of uh, what needs to be done is to sort of take a stand. If you're going to make it an abstract game, make it an abstract game. But if you are going to take a, if a a section of history that is problematic, make it a section of history that's problematic and make it clear mm -hmm. that the little brown meeple are slaves yes. from Africa. Don't, yeah, don't, don't hide sugarcoat it. it. Don't sugarcoat it. Uh, you know, make it clear that, you know, Someone could get uncomfortable playing this game, you know, you know, just put that content in there and don't try and whitewash it and make it a nice version of history because mm -hmm. history isn't nice and it doesn't help anyone to imagine it is. So that leads to another thing. Deanna has already mentioned this in the chat, but we've got this on our list to talk about. Um, I'm playing a war game. We're playing World War II. Everyone knows who the bad guys are when you're playing a World War II war game. If I am moving the gray tanks with the, the black crosses on them, does that make me a racist? I personally don't think so. I don't think that if I play the German side in Memoir 44 that I am glorifying uh, the... Uh, I'm drawing about the fascists. And I don't think it makes me a fascist by recreating a historical war battle. No. Uh, I mean, because you, you have to remember that in the case of war games, uh, especially, um, everyone is their own, is the hero in their own story. Um, whether they, uh, you know, in, again, we can look back I, in history and say that no, Hitler was wrong. No, the Russians were wrong. But at the time, the Russians were doing what they believed in. And the war games aspect of it is just that. They were generals on a battlefield trying to do the best they could with what they had, period. Uh, and for the most part, that didn't involve anything to do with the greater plot arc Politic. of the political scheme. They were trying to keep their soldiers alive and kill the opposite soldiers, which is exactly what the British were trying to do and everything else. 
and and narrowing down the war games in that manner, you know, you can you can put a lot of flavor text in the book about what was happening in the background. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, for the most part, a general is there to keep his soldiers alive and kill the other soldiers uh, in the best way they are able to with the equipment they with the equipment and, equipment and materials they have. Um, so the war games in particular, uh, separate from a, a the, the larger political war games, because there are games out there that are political, mm -hmm. um, but the war games, you know, Army X versus Army Y is really a tactics thing. And again, you know, should you make, there, should you, should you divorce it from, you know, should you make it more abstract? Uh, I'd see there are a lot of war gamers, every war gamer I know, I, I, I can think I can clearly state this and be true. Every hardcore war gamer I know is huge into history. Mm -hmm. Like they don't just recreate these battles. They read about these battles. They, yeah. they collect books on it. Osprey publishing exists because war gamers want to learn more history. Yeah. They are not just a game. They are an aspect of an entire hobby of learning from our mistakes and reading history and learning from it. Um, I actually think that people like they're there to open up that potential of learning even more so than say, I, I don't think a lot of people are going to play Puerto Rico and then go and start reading a book about that time period. Whereas if you play out the battle of Agincourt, you may be going, wow, how the hell did they win with that many archers and dig back into it and then look into all the history of the Hundred Years' War, right? Yeah. Or the War of the Roses. I might be mixing up my wars here, probably, because I'm not a war gamer and I didn't dive into history. So, but I, every war gamer I know, like I, I can think of a few off the top of my head, uh, local war gamers. Heck, one of them owns a publishing company, but they're not getting a shout out. Um, and, I, I, like wargaming tends to attract that type of person. And I think it is opened up. I like uh, libraries exist for it, right? Like I said, Osprey publishing in particular uh, thrives off the fact that, that war gamers also become history nuts. Yep. Well, I mean, you look at, uh, you look at the recreationists. I mean, you look at those people yeah. who go out and sit on battlefields with muskets or, you know, there are, there are Roman warrior there, are, you know, Roman legionnaire recreationists mm -hmm. out there. Um, and, and those people are history buffs. I mean, the SCA isn't exactly re recre recreationists, but, uh, <laughs> those people part. are gamers who, you know, generally the SCA is a, what started off as a backyard game in California, uh, and has grown to something that, uh, you know, to more or less, depending on who you are, mm -hmm. is about history. I mean, my sister sits around trying to figure out how they created a, you know, 16th century Italian outfit so that she can do it in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, and, and it came from, you know, a backyard game of people beating each other up with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's definitely, um, a certain aspect and, and group of people who delve into the historical yes. knowledge and love of it. Um, and so I, you know, does that does that mean it's okay then? Well, I think the probably thing to do yes. is is the point of playing games is to have fun with your friends, right? We've said it many times. And it's a way to make things, especially war gaming, is basically a way to make history fun. Like that's that's why they were created, is to add that competition, add that back and forth, and make things more interesting, as well as to give you a better idea of what actually happened. Um, just some notes from the chat. Jeff was suggesting if you want an indie story game that teaches about colonialization from the perspective of the indigenous population, he recommends Dog Eat Dog. Dog. It's not one. Uh, we have stuck mostly board gaming related here, but obviously this is something just as important to role playing games. Uh, role playing games, I'm going to super generalize this. The biggest thing with role playing games is, of course, consent and safety tools because you never know what's going to come up in a role playing game. That's the difference in a board game is when we sit down to play Tante Coro, we know what's going to happen in Tante Coro. You can't suddenly have one of the players decide to do start beating his girls. In a role playing game, that could happen. In a card game, that can't. You're limited. So role playing, it's the the open nature of it where more of this has to be discussed and it's potential for any game to be problematic. Whereas board games either have problematic content or don't. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to throw some problematic content into a game of checkers, right? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, again, with, when it comes to RPGs, 
it's about the players. Um, you're, and, and, and especially the DM's control over those players. You know, you could have a, you know, you could be playing D&D with a white supremacist. And mm -hmm. if everything is under control, then everything's great. But if the DM isn't going to control things and then you don't have any safety tools and that one person wants to go off and go way off base, things can go definitely sideways and yes. things are going, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable for everyone who isn't a white supremacist, um, which is hopefully everyone else at the table. Um, so oh. going on that theme, uh, you know, Secret Hitler. Yeah, I, I'll admit I am not a fan of that one. I don't understand the appeal of that game. Very quickly after it came out, someone put out a retheme called Secret Voldemort. And I don't, anyone who I go, well, why don't you play Secret Voldemort? And they're like, well, I, uh, uh, I'm like, come on. So the only reason you want to play this is so you can pretend to be Hitler and, you know, make hand signals. Like, why wouldn't you swap? I don't get it. Secret Hitler's free. It's print and play. I uh, to me that's a company that's just trying to put shock value, right? Like now the, the only reason they put that name in there. Now to be fair, I've never played the game, so I'm I'm speaking. I'm I've got the I've got the board game geek listing up right in front of me. Um, you know, you are playing the chancellor, one size the fashion, the president and the chancellor working together to pass laws in Germany in the 1930s, and one of you may be Hitler. Um. You know, again, in in concept, it could be a learning tool. Whether it actually yeah, plays not. out that it's way, a, I don't it's know. It's a social deduction, silly. There's there's no learning experience there. Right. You're not passing actual laws. You don't even discuss the laws. It just, it, uh, yes, the, if it, it could be a learning tool, but it's not. Right. Maybe if the people who put the game out turned it into a learning tool, then maybe. Fair enough. Um, and it's interesting because I, you know, I see it and it's got a 7.6 with 13,000 oh, ratings. People like it. Um, I don't know. So I said, personally, that one, I just don't understand why, why it had to be secret. Um, I so, think that's my problem with that one. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, they were obviously, you know, when they, when they took the Voldemort version, they went to the abstract. They took it, yes. they took it from mm -hmm. black meeples on Africa to cubes on a board yes uh, whereas in hitler you know with secret hitler it's it's not you know it's not black cubes on a board it is white cubes in germany <laughs> you know it's 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 white meeple in germany passing laws to mm -hmm. you know do things with uh you know do things against meeple with pink triangles and you know six-sided yeah. stars well it, it mainly it was someone just trying to cash in on the hit that was cards against humanity which right. we've talked about quite a bit on this show, is a game with problematic content. And again, even though I hate the game, I will say there are people out there that enjoy it. And the important thing, as I said with all these, I don't like the comics code. Put out Cards Against Humanity, sell it like crazy. The people behind Cards Against Humanity have done awesome things with the money that game's raised. I don't want to play it, but you might want to. Just have that conversation. Don't show up to my house expecting me to play Cards Against Humanity. If you know you have a game with problematic content, that's a, hey, is it okay if I bring Cards Against Humanity? I'll be like, no, I'd prefer you don't. Uh, don't just show up and expect people to play. Also, be aware, this is important for all of these games, actually, of the environment you are playing in. One of my biggest beefs with against Cards Against Humanity is people who bring it out to public play events. Like, the cards in that game are offensive. They are. They might not offend you, but they're going to offend someone. I have been at an event where people are playing this saying things about races that are at the next table over like besides the fact that just uncouth and uncool do you want to get in a fight like like what are you doing like you're trying to start a bar fight like why why would you try to provoke the other people in a public venue that are just there to enjoy their night by calling out stuff like this it's hard not to swear this episode. It was actually it was actually interesting. Uh it, I haven't played Cards Against Humanity specifically, but there was a similar game that got brought out at uh, a family event. Uh and now the kids were all sent inside to watch movies, but you right. know, and it was all adults, but it was still problematic because I'm playing this game with my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law yeah, and, and 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 it was very much a uh you know, there were there was a lot of sexual content and discussions and you know it's one of those things where yeah we're all adults here but at the same point i don't want to be talking about this kind of stuff and there were stuff like 
yeah, no, I'm just skipping that card. Sorry, not mm -hmm. not happening. Get uh, another use of the X card without an X card there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, I, I there's a bunch of them, right? Cards Against Humanity was the first. It's the most well done. There are people who have tried to make worse games um, because, you know, that wasn't offensive enough. There are a ton of After Dark games. I personally, I don't get the desire to turn a game that often, like Telestrations, for example, when we play that at three in the morning with people and there's been drinks, it often goes there. I don't see why you need to go there like implicitly. Like if your game goes there and you start getting into the sexual innuendos and people start drawing suggestive things in Telestrations, that can be pretty hilarious. I don't need a game where it's going to tell me to draw offensive things. Same thing with like Apples to Apples tends to get rather suggestive, but it's more that innuendo, right? It's it's the Tante Coro of cards, like versus Cards Against Humanity. You're not quite there. Like the, the actual hints aren't pushing you that way as opposed to the explicit. But again, I'm saying Cards Against Humanity is a thing. People play it. People like it. Yeah. Go ahead. Play it. Enjoy it. I don't want to play with you. I don't want to be at a public event with you playing it, and I don't want you to offend someone else I'm with by being at a public event. Yeah. Save it for playing at home with a bunch of people who have enthusiastically consented to playing. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of games that can go dirty, and if you're in the right group and you all know each other and you all have that sh and share that sensibility and sense of humor, you can go that way without the game pushing you that way. Yes. Right, and that's what we've said all along. So I think at this point, we're kind of going in circles. I think the, the main things here is, first, I, Sean hasn't really said either way if he thinks they should exist. I personally think all these games should exist. I have no problem. My dad collected a collectible card game called Xenophile with three X's. Uh, it was in the Magic the Gathering craze, and they thought it'd be cool to throw lots of naked people and sex into a card game. Hey, whatever. My dad likes that kind of stuff. Sure, it's allowed to exist. It's not something I'm interested in playing. Consenticles out there. Here's a game turning that whole subversive nature, uh, exploitation on side, and making a game distinctly about sex that is sex positive and is is saying that it's okay. Both very cool games. I'm not interested in playing either of them. In the middle are games like Conte Coro, who suggested. Uh, then there's Veroticon, which I mentioned before. I They're all fine. I don't mind Mombasa, Puerto Rico, or any other colonization games. I do dig that we're moving away from that, that there are more games that have gone to other topics. Like Jeff mentioned in the chat, he talked about Concordia, which is all about the Roman Empire already being built. They've already done their bad thing. We're talking about the highlight of the area and doing merchants and trade ships and building up an existing empire. Cool. Uh, I'm all for that. War games play Nazis? Yes. Play whatever sides. We're involved in the actual battles. It's about simulation and learning uh, about the time periods and head-to-head -head competition. Uh, Cards Against Humanity, feel free to play it. The whole thing, though, is be aware that these games have problematic content. Don't just plug your ears. Don't be the the the, the privileged person who doesn't care and says it's just a game. Yes, it's just a game, but it's a game about something that may affect people, that there are issues, that there, there's more to it than the game, and be aware of that. But then make your own decision about it. Play it if you want, don't play it. I'm not here to judge whether you like games or what games you like, which games you don't. I'm just here to have fun playing games that I enjoy with other consenting players at my game table. Now, I, I'm going to say I agree. Now, what I will say, though, is I think there are some games that do exist his, from his historic point of view that should not <laughs> and, and, and should be put away. Uh, I'm actually looking at a, uh, a list verse post right now of uh, a quick little search for the 10 most offensive board games ever. Okay. Um, and actually, you know what, to be honest, I don't actually agree with a lot of them. Uh, I think a lot of these games are, you know, stop being a prude. You know, there's a, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a memory game where you're matching Breasts. Breasts. Yeah. yeah. You know, whatever. Once a memo. Um, and actually, uh, in the in the chat room, uh, and she games mentions Ms. Monopoly. Game Monopoly is a thing. Uh, I haven't. I don't know enough about it, but I'm suspecting it may actually be offensive. But again, I I think it's actually about gays and not against. Now, the number two and number one games on this list. Uh, the number two game is Five Little N-Word Boys, and I am just yeah, going to say that's... it. And it is a pop gun target shooting game. Yeah, okay. Uh, that doesn't exist. That that, no, that, that does not that... need to exist. Uh, yeah, it is, I agree. 
possibly one of the most offensive things I have ever seen. The number one game on the list is Juden Raus, which is German for Jews Out, where you roll your dice to go to the houses of Jews, and the first person to collect and expel six mm. Jews from the city is the, uh, from the rules, the undoubted winner. Uh, and this was published in 1938, shortly after uh, the Kristallnacht in Germany. Um, and yes, it represents something that was historically happening at the time, but that does not need to be gamified. Um, Fair. And, you know, yes, I'm sure having a historical version of that in a museum somewhere is of value. But outside of yeah. that, that game doesn't need to exist. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a role-playing equivalent, Rahowa. Right. I'm not going to talk about it, but if people want to Google it, they could Google it. That game, no. Yep. Now, Fatal, despite all its flaws, okay, sure, it's 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 a piece of... It, it, it deserves to exist as much as Alan uh, Crumb's artwork from the comic book periods right. for 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 similar level of lowbrow humor. But yeah, uh, there there's a... Yes, there are some exceptions, I think, to take it ridiculous too far. Absolutely. I, I can't disagree with that. Uh, again, it's, you know, I, I look at I look at American free speech. Americans have free speech, but it is limited by the court. You know, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Uh, you know, you cannot make death threats. Uh, there are limits on free speech for a reason. And in the same way, while 90%, 99% of games should exist, and as long as you approach them with consent throughout the group, yes. go ahead. But that doesn't mean there aren't the occasional one that slipped through that just need to be stopped. And so now that we've either gained a bunch of listeners or <laughs> lost a bunch, and I'm not really sure which way that's going to go, I'm expecting I maybe get some mail one way or the other <laughs> on this particular topic. Yeah. Uh, we got anything else we missed in the lobby. I know there was some good stuff. That it was going through. All right, we're checking into the lobby here now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going in there. So, you know, games are funnier uh, when the humor comes from the players instead of the game. Uh, very true. You know, very, very much. Um, Moniker apparently makes you do charades for things like Hitler, Putin, or Sweet Baby Jesus. Mm. Again, if you know that's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, kittens in a blender uh, make making people uncomfortable. See, that's one I'm like, oh, it, it, I haven't yet to see anyone uncomfortable for that by that, but I'm glad to hear it, actually, to be honest, because, like, really, what a kind of horrible concept. I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably wanted to do babies in a blender and decided that wasn't acceptable. Probably. Uh, and here, Jeff's just got a great point here. So the thing that matters most is the presence of glorification of these things. Mm. So Good if point. you are doing a an educational game that is putting the proper experience around... G about, um, uh, you know, about the eviction of Jews from Germany during the Nazi occupation, that's one thing. If you are glorifying the extraction of Jews from their homes and the mm -hmm. ejection from the city, that's a whole different thing. You know, that's... Oh, I totally agree. <laughs> that, that, that's a you know, really good there's, point. There's a, there's, a that, strong, there's a strong line there, and Jeff, Jeff really put that well. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, Deanna was talking about Fire in the Lake. Our friend Jason brought this over and with Neil and both of them. So here's an example of a war gamer who is into history, right? Dude became an archaeologist and is into historical games uh, because he wants to touch those time periods he can't be part of in a way that you can't really do any other way just by reading, right? There's something else that gaming lets you do. Uh, we played a game called Fire in the Lake. This is all about the Vietnam War. And Man, Jason and Neil together knew the history of the war so well and the Viet Cong and who the factions were. And he was teaching it to us while we played the game. And Deanna noted that was a phenomenal experience for her. And that made the game so much better because it wasn't otherwise. It was literally pushing cubes on a map without knowing the history. And I knew all the histories in the rule book, but as the person who showed up and got taught the game. Um, she also noted Academy Games. They're the ones that make Freedom the Underground Railroad as well as um, 1812, the um, War for Canada. Like They make a ton of war games, but all of them are steeped with tons of historic background, and they are so no well known for handling topics 
delicately and properly that they now are in schools and you can buy teachers editions of all their games so you can actually buy a teacher edition of freedom the underground railroad so for your class or school if you are covering the underground railroad you can actually use the game to teach the concepts and what's going on in that game interesting major kayla is bringing up uh the 90s when dead baby jokes were a thing Um, yes and it was a huge thing and you know what at the time i had thought it oh silly dumb jokes uh later in life uh you know my wife and i had a miscarriage uh and Mm -hmm. things got a little more real and you know a lot of it's hard to think about some of these things out there but it really is um you know there really is a reason why these jokes aren't okay uh and i think to anyone who has lost a child uh in any form um it's really not okay that you know you could literally walk into uh coals or an indigo and see a wall of books about dead babies um humorous or not it's um disturbing okay violence against children is something that completely changed for me once i had kids just just like stupid youtube videos of kids doing dumb things getting hurt i might have found funny at one time and now i just like i can't watch them like i it's almost to the point of, of like like i have to shut it down oh, see i uh, see i'm like, on the other hand i actually show my kids fail videos deliberately and explain to them why this person why kid, is an idiot yes. and uh-huh. why you should not be doing these things um yes. i i one of, one of the lines you'll hear deanna say the most in our house so you did something stupid and someone got hurt that, that is we yeah. hear that a lot I, but no there's some of those fail videos that you like there's just this one where this guy break dancing and there's kids like there's a ring of people around and this little girl walks in and gets kicked right. like I, I i'm sure before i might have thought that was funny or i'd at least had now i'm like i can't even watch that like, I just think about my own kid getting yep. kicked and, oh, my God, that kid's got to be hurt. And, like, the video cuts off and I'm wondering if they're okay. Like, there's there's a definite change there. I know. I, I, I literally use fail videos as teaching <laughs> experiences all, all the time because, uh, you know, my kids are, you know, the kinds who, who would still laugh at that thing. They're at that age where, you know, things yeah. are funny. Oh, look, someone fell down. It got funny. You know, they love slapstick comedy. Uh, and I find a lot of the fail videos... Um, within limits there there are certain fail fail channels that mm. tend to show more extreme stuff and i won't uh, i won't go there but there's a couple of sort of general ones that play around the same level of intensity as america's funniest home videos used to um so um you know those are the ones where you can get the teaching experiences in there mm. like look that guy wasn't wearing a helmet you watched how hard his head bounced off yes. the pavement when he fell off his skateboard <laughs> Um, it's not funny when he can't remember his name tomorrow. No, <sighs> but uh, well, we kind of went off on a rant did. there. <laughs> so bring it back. Uh, just to, to quickly summarize, there are games out there that have content that you may or may not find problematic. But realize there are games out there that people will find problematic. If that they're not you, there are people out there that are going to be bothered by some games. It's still okay to play those games. They're not necessarily horrible. There are some exceptions that are truly horrible. But the big thing is getting everyone on board and making sure people consent. And important to me is realizing the problematic nature of the games, acknowledging that. For board game designers and publishers, it's awesome to see that more of them are including the what actually happened in the back of the book. Endeavor is a great example of that. They fully explained that yes, in this game, there is the theme of slavery. We purposely made it so that it is a high risk, high reward way to do it. But we go forward in time and added time to the game so that the abolishment of slavery can happen in the game. And if you own slaves, then you're in trouble in the game, right? And they explain why all this was included, how it was included, and what it represents historically. I'd love to see more stuff like that. But even if it's not there, you can do the research yourself realize that the problem is there acknowledge that it's there and then make an informed decision on if you're still cool with playing the game these are games they're meant to be fun they're there to play with your friends and have fun with your friends but it'd be kind of cool if the four of you or whoever you're playing with also learn something at the same time absolutely well that's going to be it for this week's ask the bellhop if you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice Uh, If you got questions for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 